Gravita, when you need me, all you gotta do is holler. Gravita, not for real, I'ma hear you when you holler. I'll be right there in my cape, FSK below my collar. Oh, trouble, want some trouble? Well, then I'm double, let's get it poppin'. I got some issues I've been dealing with. About to lose my scholarships. Friends, family, loved ones, so you know inside I'm sick. You may think you're tough, but you don't know what you're about to get. I let it build up, then feed you all of it. No apologies. no apologies, this may hurt a bit. Hurt. No. What up, what up? We back for part three. We in the building, F-S-K. Back again, part three of Freestyle Comics Day. Yes, we are out here with our, oh, we all got our marvelous FSK shirts on right now. The marvelous editions. Oh, get those at the shop, $13 today. <laughs> it's in the link, it's in the cop. No, not the comments, it's in the little... Edit. You, it, look, it's places. It's it's right here. If you're if you're looking at the screen, it's right up there. The link for the shirts, all of it, all that stuff. Hey, I'm super jazzed up. We got another a banger coming out to you. Uh, the VIPs of self publishing. We're in the building right now. Let's bring them on up. First off, Vic Bandage, the man, the host, bringing it back. Hard work, the man in comics. He is on his third outfit today, people. This only my second outfit. This is my moderating outfit. No, no. When you you last time you wore it, you wore the hat backwards to the side. This time you wore the hat. Did that count? That, 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 that counts. counts. Oh, okay, well then shoot, I'll take it. I'll take it. Are, are you wearing the 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 traditional work from home? You got like basketball shorts on? Not and not today. Actually, I'm wearing actual pants today. Oh, normally basketball shorts. Normally, I am pants less when I do these pants. Okay, okay. I'm gonna tell you that right now. Right here, you heard it right here. All right, so. Before we jump in this panel, I got one more. I'm hitting y'all with these Carla testimonials throughout the whole day. Let's go. I'm giving you one more here. I believe. Okay. 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 Yeah. So you don't you don't think if that was you in that situation, you would feel some type of way that the best friend, who's also another female, knew before you did. <laughs> I would have to dig a little deeper because does did, did did she know of the best friend prior to like is this somebody that she she knows of and can can kind of um uh, say that that's kind of her friend if you will mm -hmm. off of the strength that that's him because I would say that if the if the relationship was already known prior to them being together she like if he came into the relationship saying okay this is my best friend you know I I would assume that she probably does know a lot more than me. Okay. Okay. Because I knew coming into the relationship that that was his best friend, so I can only assume that I have a lot of male best friends, and I mm -hmm. hold a lot of secrets for them <laughs> that their women are not privy to, and that's my best friend. So I'm not going to share that with you just because you're his woman. You know, that's that's our relationship. But again, I would never cross the line of you know uh, the line of a uh, sexual relationship versus friendship with my best friend. So I I kind of think that she has to. It would depend on the relationship, how it was, it was presented to her initially. Okay. That's what right. it would be based on. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. This feedback, this this is awesome. Getting these different perspectives and, you know, especially getting it from a female that, you know, plotting that out and thinking it from different angles. I want to thank you for joining us today. And I'm going to return it back to our panel. Awesome. That's real. That's that right there. <laughs> The brown sugar argument, okay? The brown sugar argument. Tay Diggs' wife didn't know nearly as much as his best friend. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, it's real. Come all right. On. Well, we're about to get this bad boy storm. Uh, storm. Started. 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 Hey, You've you been climbing all day. Look I'm at you. Sloppy. I'm getting sloppy today, baby. Come on, all now. Right. <laughs> all right, let's get it cracking. Let's do some of this branding. Let's get the uh, thing looking real good. Let's check in with our people, see how they're doing collecting this money for us today, because we're looking for $1 donations. Mm -hmm. You're more than welcome to give more. Yeah, they're still hard at work, everybody. I cannot believe the star power that has come out for FSK today. This is ridiculous. I mean, Oprah is still here. She's been here since 10 a.m. I don't know what David Spade's doing. He's just sitting there. 
He's not doing anything. He's I, actually reading Hot Shot right now. <laughs> that's what it is? Okay. He's that's reading Hot Shot. That's what he's doing. He downloaded it and he's reading it on his phone in his lap. That's what he's doing. All right. Hey, well, David, tell us how you feel. But get these <laughs> donations, baby. That's what we're here for today. Let's get this panel started, everybody. But to get the information where you can donate right now. Oh, where are we at? Oh, I have. We gotta do another tally. Yeah, we gotta do another tally. All right, cause we yeah we're getting there. Bang! Man, that theme song gets me going every time. Oh my it's goodness! Exciting, right? Every time. Every That's my time. Time. Either, boy. She gets it. Ooh, child. Ooh, child. Get me excited, ladies uh, and gentlemen. Yeah. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Wait, wait. Did you? Were you gonna say something? Mike? I'm sorry. Saying, updated total right now is four seventy-seven. Hey. Okay. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> let Let's get five hundred by the Listen. end. Of Panel. We gonna do that. What we about to drop right now is about to be worth that. Promise, right. trust. Okay, that's what we about to do. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the VIPs of self publishing. I'm Victor Dangers, the hardest working man in comics, and it is my honor to have on this virtual stage some of the most prolific creators in the game. I'm gonna have you guys give yourselves a quick intro as we run around the room, um, but I'm gonna break it down. I'm gonna start with Cat first, and then we'll work our way around the lorry, and we'll work our way back up. That's what we'll do. So, Cat, take it away. Well, thank you, and congrats on on uh, the hard day and, and the great show. Uh, but yeah, I'm Kat. Uh, most people know me as Comic Inno because of uh, the YouTube stuff. I do YouTube reviews. But this is about publishing comics, so I uh, write Like Father, Like Daughter. We're actually going to launch the Kickstarter for Like Daughter, like Father, Like Daughter, issue 7 in November. Very excited for that. Uh, just gave the packages for issue six. So also excited to, for everyone to have in their hands. And also I'm the writer for They Call Her The Dancer. Beautiful, beautiful. Lori, Lori. Brown book, by the way. I love it. I need Thank that. you. How you really feel, Mike? How you really feel? It's my favorite thing to write. <laughs> I feel like you're holding back still. Lori, please. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Um, I'm Lori Foster. Um, I co-own Unlikely Hero Studios. I write, I edit, and I ink for them as well. Love it. Absolutely uh, love it. She's a beast. She's also known as New Life. If you pencil, she will give new life to your pencils because she's an inker extraordinaire. She did the two pages? The two pages? Yes, she, you did. Did. yes she did. He has been talking about these two pages <laughs> since you gave it to him, okay? Like, it's it's almost it's almost obscene, okay? Like, we're, the two pages have already applied for a restraining order for Mike. I just want you to know that you did that. Thank you. Um, I'm the president of Hero Tomorrow Comics, um, creator, co-writer of Apama, The Undiscovered Animal, creator, writer, um, also colorist on these, um, Tap Dance Killer, and our new one, uh, Punchline, and the Vaud Villains. Love that, love that. Chuck! Old What's going killer. on, gang? Uh, old school killer right there, Ted. Old school killer. <laughs> I love his style. I love it. Thank you, sir. <laughs> What's up, everybody? I'm Chuck Pino. I'm a freelance writer and editor, uh, creator of such things as Belial, Essence House, Welcome to the Void. Belial 2 is on Kickstarter right now. Um, Essence House, the audio drama, is being turned into a novel and will be on Kickstarter on November 1st. And, of course, you can always check out my Chuck's Raw Reviews where I talk about amazing books that I love here on YouTube. I love it. I love it. Somebody in the comments said, Chuck MFing Pino. Now that's your new title. That is your new title right there. It's not that new, but I'll take oh, it. Oh, well, okay. <laughs> that's, that's perfect, because Chuck, I ain't got a nickname for you yet, because we ain't been kicking it yet. I've been kicking it with all them down there, so I got I, I know them. But this you ain't need to kick it more. So I just, a, you, and I, you and I are about to kick, homie. We're about to kick. <laughs> this has got real. Y'all don't even know. Uh, most epic art, who is you? What oh, do you do? I, I'm just a kid from a little city called Cleveland. I just happen to be the most enthusiastic person in comics, publisher of Short Fuse Media Group, founder of Freestyle Comics, aka Superman Brother in the building, and lead artist and creative at Freestyle mm -hmm. Comics on Hot Shot, little book that's out here. I love it. I love it. 
So once again, I'm Victor Dandridge. I am the uh, owner and creator of Vantage House Productions, which just celebrated 10 years of full-time self-publishing uh, last week. So what I've done is I've taken some of the different things that I've... What? You just kept Danny. I'm sorry. He don't love me. It only says you. But we both in the window. I, I can't. <laughs> listen. You in the window. Danny's in the window. Veronica's in the window. I didn't know that everybody was doing it. I said he come on. earlier. See? <laughs> See, I was expecting the, the, the other picture piece for Danny. Okay, my bad. Told you. All right, so I'm Danny Cooper. <laughs> I'm editor-in-chief of Freestyle Comics. I'm our lead letter, um, aspiring writer, future writer for Heroes International. Um, I think that covers about everything. Yeah, real quick. Most diligent, wait, wait, Google searching, technical, <laughs> finding something, get you together, person that I know. Next to Victor Danger and Ray McKenzie. Thanks. Danny takes take. He gets me together all the time. And I love it. I love it for it. And shout out to Veronica, who's back there. Hi, Veronica. Hold it down. Hold it down. So through through my years of self-publishing, there are concepts, precepts, ideals that I think uh, make for an easier process to get work out. And I call them the, the VIPs of self-publishing or five important principles of self-publishing. So with this... I want to throw these ideas out and see how you guys have handled them in your own experiences of creativity. So starting off with uh, important principle number one is knowing the difference between an idea versus a story. And we kind of touched on this in the last panel. I was really afraid that Danny's whole talking point was going to make me reveal everything. So I'm so <laughs> lucky that he didn't. But, um, you know, so many times we have we have ideas and ideas are a dime a dozen. That's cool. But it doesn't make it a story. How many times have we encountered someone that's like, oh, I got this idea for a comic. And then it's word vomit of a series of and then and then and thens. But it's not really that beginning, middle and end of a story. Right. How, how do you guys handle that? How do you solve that issue of having a cool idea, but letting it develop into that beginning, middle and end of a story? And uh, Ted, I'm going to start with you first, if you don't mind. No, I don't mind. Um, yeah, well, uh, it is for me about just compiling ideas, you know, and uh, trying to see which one starts to rise. You know, I, I think I'm going to kind of go back to the example I just did on this punchline character because he was just an idea. You know, mm -hmm. it was just that I, I had this idea for a heavyweight boxer who would become a murderous clown assassin. In the Apama series, he was made to be an Apama villain, but the Apama story was taking so long, you know, and, and because we're in the indie comics field, you know, I, we, we, we go at glacier speed sometimes. Um, so the Tap Dance Killer spun off, and then I have this idea for this boxing killer clown. And I thought, man, now now I really see his story. It became it went from an idea to to an arc, you know, like how he inter integrates into our world because of other characters that were introduced. I had a really nice on-ramp for this character all of a sudden. And then once that happens, you know, the ideas just start stacking up and then you start outlining and you feel like I've got a nice arc for this character now. And, and I think it's very important to know where you're going to end up. You don't have to have all the details in the middle, but once you, once you do have that ending um, or, or ending of an arc, then uh, you know, and the other thing I think is even more important, you know, than story um, is character. Like if you create if you create great characters that are deep, you know, and you, you answer all the backstory questions about them, you know, what is their favorite food, et cetera. Um, they're so much easier to write. And, you know, just having a guy who's a boxing clown, that's not a full fledged character. But once I realized where he came from and, and you know, what his relationship histories were like it all fit into the universe. Um, I, I, so I hope that answered it. I, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. It's a great, that. it's a great showcase of that concept. And Lori, I'm going to pass the baton to you to see how you handle those things. All right. Um, well, I think it's really important to simmer on ideas too. Like I, a lot of people, like you said, just have this really good idea and then they get really excited. Um, I see it. I see it a lot in the indie community. Like they, they come up with a character and they get really excited and then they start getting art made of the character. But like all they have is like a character and a look and they don't really have anything past that. And then they never go further than that. That's where mm -hmm. it stops. Um, Cause they get so excited about that one thing. And it's good to get excited about a character, but like you need to go back and you need to kind of plot out at least some kind of outline and for, for an arc, like you said, or, or something like a, like you need more than that. You need a 
Get a bill. Get a bill. Absolutely. Yeah. No, and like you don't that. need a full script necessarily, right? but like you need to start with something. You need an outline. You need a path at the very least. I yeah. agree with that. Kat? Yeah, no, I think you bring up a really good point. I think in the indie community, especially, you, you do see that as like, oh, cool, I have a couple of pages. It's like, but what's the story? What is this about? And, you know, when you have that idea, you get very excited about that spark of your idea. But I think, you know, when you're writing something real, when you get that roadblock, you're like, mm -hmm. oh, I'm not excited about this anymore. But then you figure out how to get excited about it again. You're like, oh, that works, that works, that works. And I think, yeah, it's the journey, either A, doing research or B, figuring out your characters, your setting, your themes and and getting falling in love over and over again with the same mm -hmm. thing, I think is a really big process. But I'm always a firm believer of, yes, A, outlines, you got to outline your stuff, but then B, I do think, especially in the indie community, I think we, we do need to work ahead a little bit too. I think, you know, having maybe uh, an issue one script ready, um, obviously knowing where your arc is going, I think really preparation's the number one rule of indie publishing because uh, you can't that. just jump the gun. That's real. Um, that, we're going to come back around on that one at, a, at a, another midpoint that I think is going to be perfect for you to come back on that. Chuck, if you will. Uh, you know, Dave Chappelle, I think, brought up a really cool analogy, and he would say a good idea drives the car, and you're the passenger. And he says, you know, like a good idea will come up, and he'll be like, man, it's time. Get your ass in here. We're going to go. And if you're the one driving the car, then that's a statement of ego, and you're doing it for yourself rather than for the fact that, no, this is the time, this is the idea, this is what's going to work best right now. And so I try to follow that. I try to follow my gut and, and what feels right. I, I do agree, like as an editor and whatnot, I do think like planning stuff out and all that, that comes, but you don't have to force that. A good idea will tell you, hey man, this point is important, this point, and it will start putting those things out there. And then you go, oh crap, I gotta write this. Like I, I have to make this happen because it's telling me it has to. And so you gotta listen to that part and not tell it. And if you're telling it, it's not time for that one let. Put it back. It'll come back. Don't worry about it. Or it won't. It might never be the time for that one. That's so well said. Oh, my God. I love that. And and Mike and Davey, with as you being kind of the newer writers uh, in this position, I really want to hear what your thoughts are on that one. Man. <laughs> what happened to the most enthusiastic person? Man. Yeah, I know. What is that? Because writing serious. Yes, it is. Right? Yes, it is. Uh, uh, LaShawn just came over to uh, Emerald Quest and she tore into me. Uh, <laughs> She's been there five minutes. She let loose. Uh, Danny, uh, I, I can't gauge him on when I send him in a script. Uh, he has a very good poker face, but I know whatever comes, you know, whatever he brings, he's going to tell me the truth and uh, really provide a lot of guidance. Uh, when it comes to things like writing, uh, which is it's not my strongest point, but it's something I'm definitely – trying to venture into, I lean on other people to be honest, to give me the the right type of the honest, the feedback that I need to hear, not what I want to hear. Because uh, as Lloyd is discovering over the last two days, I get I get into this comic book game. I get excited and uh, I, I, I pop off this. As Danny said earlier, this this thing started off as a dollar thought and look what it is. <laughs> it's like 50, 11 different people talking. Yeah, but that's Mike. I, I like feedback. I, I live and breathe in a team environment. I absolutely enjoy it. So uh, networking and talking and, and, and just going through ideas and throwing stuff on the wall, seeing what sticks and, and getting people's feedback really does help. I think that looking at it from the FSK perspective where we have so many titles and books and we have all these stories we're trying to tell, we really are trying to build this universe where everything connects. Um, I'm guilty of being the, the idea of what if guy and, throwing these crazy ideas out at times and, but knowing when not to be married to those and say, you know what, the direction we're trying to go, this isn't going to work. Maybe we can work this in some way later, but uh, let's, let's put that to the side for now and focus, you know, on the direction we're going. A, a good example is last year's FSK day. I throw this crazy <laughs> idea at Mike and we got some great pictures of it when I'm telling him the story. He just has <laughs> like, what the hell? Look on his face. Uh, I, you know, it, though it may have been a fantastic idea in my opinion, um, a very great way to take hot shot in a, a little bit of a different direction. It didn't work with the story we were trying to tell, which was also very personal and passion, you know, very uh, personal to Mike and somebody who's very passionate about telling this current storyline. So it was a great idea, but you know, maybe it's, now's not the time to work that into our story. And, and we talked about that. Like we got into our feelings 
<laughs> about that because like when I came up to Danny and uh, I was so excited about the story that I had laid out for the next four issues of Hot Shot. And it, it is a very, very personal uh, story. It, it deals with my mom. Uh, my stepdad used to beat on my mom every night. Uh, me being a kid and, you know, honestly not doing anything because my mom told me to go back to my room. And um, I still struggle with that choice. I feel like I did the wrong thing. I should have went up there and helped my mom. Now, me being a grown up, I understand I'm a kid. What can I do? I get that. But that's my mom. And I feel like I bitched out. So that's something I still deal with. And I want to examine that in the story. And we, I did all that and laid it out. I came to Danny things. Man, that is so good. But what if we blow off Hot Shot? <laughs> <laughs> like, what? You make that sound so arbitrary. Danny had a great idea. That's terrible. <laughs> it was a good idea. It, it is a good idea. And it's definitely, once we talked about it and we, we got outside of ourselves <laughs> and we sat down and discussed it, we're like, well, it's definitely something I think we can do after this arc. Um, it's just not the direction I want to go with these four issues. And Danny, again, like we're honest with each other. So he saw, once he read through it and whatnot, he saw what I was talking about. And there's been times where I've been excited about something. And Danny's like, no, nah, that's not, it's not going to work. <laughs> it's, it's not. It just, I'm just, no. not it. and um, we kind of live and breathe by the, if we can't, if we can't convert the other person to understand where it's coming from, then it doesn't work or whatnot. Um, you got to have a good case when we're butting heads on something. And so I definitely do want to do the story that Danny has planned because we've changed things from, you know, what was originally planned. So I definitely see a spot for it um, after these, after this story. I like that. I like that. Um, Jay man actually brought in a, a point that I think is great. Yeah. Uh, can it be frustrating coming up with an original idea, names of characters and story punchline sounds like an original idea and story, but the name is used by DC with Joker's new girlfriend. And I think this kind of fits into this thing of why so often we, as creators, we get an idea and we jump because we're afraid that someone else is going to use it. Is that, is that accurate? Well, yeah. What, um, I mean, ours came out two years before DC. Right. Sure did. And so they are buyers. That's so right. It's, um, I think it is important that, yeah. I mean, is that frustrating that DC took the name I was using and turned it into their most popular character? Yeah. That's frustrating. Um, could that be a legal problem for DC? It could be, you know, I, we're not, um, but at the same time, I just want to, I'm right now, I want to tell the story I've always intended to tell. That's right. Hey, but I, That's I'm right. in your court. I know you had that character. <laughs> I got you. We had a half page ad and a preview guide introducing punchline. You know, it was, yeah, it was, it was easy to see. It's provable, provable. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah. item number two. Okay. Uh, indie versus indie, I N D I E versus I N D Y. And what that means to me is uh, an idea of style, uh, scope, and scale, right? So I N D I E is a typical tr term for indie comics, right? But that can also mean alternative underground comics, uh, which I think for the most part, we're not producing. We're producing something that's a little bit more akin to the mainstream, superhero-oriented, that classic showcase. And sometimes you need that separation so that people understand what kind of product you're making. And for that one, I lean on Kablam's uh, uh, sister uh, site, Indie Planet, I-N-D-Y, to kind of showcase that if you are more of a, a self-publishing creator, but you lean more towards the mainstream side of things, that that's I-N-D-Y versus I-N-D-I-E. How did you determine what kind of books you were going to make. And Mike, I'm going to start with you. I make comics. <laughs> wow. That's right. are, are, you, are, you, are you suggesting that alternative comics are not comics? Or what are you saying? Where, do, where are you going with that? I'm not saying they're not comic books. Um, and I perfectly understand what you're saying. And I know that is a legitimate thing. Um, my thing with indie or indie, i.e. or why, is that a lot of times when people say that name or use those terminology to say, oh, this is a good book for indie. Uh, well, I I love my indie brethren. I love them, all of them. We out here making these books. But I feel like a lot of the books that we make are on par or better than what is being made in mainstream. Say like, that again for the cheap seats in the back. <laughs> on par or better, fourth go, air go, than mainstream. Um, like if you put, if you take this crew right now on this panel and put our books up in a comic book shop, against Marvel and DC and put those books together, it's a positive and a negative. They they don't stand out. They look just like the comic books right next to them. 
which is also a bad thing because they blend in. But what <laughs> my, my point is that they look just as good, if not better, than a Spider-Man book, a Wonder Woman book, a Superman book, uh, whatever image is producing at this time because they just do whatever. Um, so I, for, in my opinion, and it's not a knock, it's just what I believe, I just make comic books. My thing is a comic book. I feel like it's on par with anybody else's. I just want kids and other geeks to read my books and geek the fuck out when they read and find out that Carla had reasons. Wow, wow. As Danny said before, reasons are just excuses. So, Danny, if you would, uh, in terms of that that idea, IE versus Y, is it important to you to have that understanding of what type of books you're you're going to create? You know, I, I got to be honest. I think that when you, it depends on the the customer you're going you're trying to market to. And obviously, we want we want to get every customer possible. Um, I think there's a, a, a there can be a challenge of trying to grab those mainstream customers because they want that kick, they want Spider Man or they want Batman on the book, and it is an investment to to invest in indie comic, whether it's I E or Y. You know, Ted, to your point earlier, sometimes we move at the speed of a glacier. So I'm going to invest in this series that may take another six months to a year to get that next issue. Um, so I think there's a challenge there to invest in that. And for me, the the spelling of I E versus Y doesn't matter. I feel that people still label that when you say it out loud, indie it doesn't matter if you're spelling with an I E or a Y. They're still they still have that label they assign the books and oh that's indie. I think sometimes calling a book indie has a negative context to it because people almost downgrade they they're downgrading the expected quality whether it's the art the story as a letter whether it's the letters in the book they're going to downgrade it to a certain degree and be put off immediately because it's not oh that's indie work. And it doesn't matter if they're spelling it with a Y or an IE. They, it mm. has that same label to it. That's a that's a heady one. I like that, Chuck. Man, the spelling only matters when I'm when I'm proofing. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I, I, I feel I feel Mike all the way there, man. Um, at the end of the day, I'm making comics, and if you have a label for it, you label it. But in the meantime, I, I'm too busy making good stuff, and I think that's what we're all about. I do have like a zine that I'm working on and it's a little more underground, but that doesn't mean that I don't try to still treat it as a professional product and mm -hmm. put the care and the thought into it. It doesn't mean I don't get to half-ass that shit, you know? So um, I'm going to push it like it's, like it's the big stuff and I'm going to keep going forward with it and I'm going to make it happen regardless. So you guys call it what you want. I'm still, I I'm too busy making. I like it. I like it. And Vic, to jump in, you know, I definitely want to make a point that, um, my goal is not to sound bitter or, or point out the challenges of selling your book. You know, mm -hmm. I, I can go to a table at a con and sell books, not like Mike can. I've, I've seen him convert people and make sales. <laughs> you can convince people to buy books. It doesn't matter if it's mm -hmm. an independent book. They've got to connect with you as the creator and mm -hmm. have an interest in what you're selling. So I don't want to make sure that I don't come across uh, this better, this bitter <laughs> sense of, and it's hard to sell any books. That's not the point at all. Mm -hmm. I'm with you. I'm with you. Ted. Yeah. Um, I, I, I hadn't really heard that before. Um, I, I definitely understand the two different styles um, mm -hmm. or, or approaches. We always, uh, you know, um, the Bronze Age, like when I go through the comic convention floor, those 70s covers just pop. You know, there's something graphic about them, the text on them, you know, and, and we wanted to kind of recreate that for a new generation. You know, this sort of, um, the, the, yeah, the cover has a story right there on it. And, you know, it's not like going through my ultimate Spider-Man collection and cover after cover is just like a generic pinup of Spider-Man. You don't know mm -hmm. what's inside. But like those amazing Spider-Man covers from 100 to 150. Oh, my God. I mean, that's they're beautiful. So that's what we wanted to do. And yeah, more more something kind of familiar, kind of old. We just were, we were kind of shooting for something timeless, really. Nice. Nice. Lori? Right. Oh. Ooh, OK, I've been like sitting here, like building up shit say <laughs> um, okay yeah i've never heard of the ie versus y differentiation actually that's new to me um i'm kind of with mike like uh we make comics uh i think it's actually a bad idea to pigeonhole yourself and only make superhero comics uh or pigeonhole yourself and only make alternative comics i don't think there's a reason for that i think uh, for, like if we want to use image as an example, like they only make alternative books or whatever. And I think they're stupid for doing that. Like they could release really fucking good superhero books and they're not. Mm. 
So instead, I'm going to do that, I guess. Like, there you go. There you go. <laughs> you know, like, Where you lack, I'm coming up. I like that. Right. Um, so I think you can do both, and I don't think there has to be a differentiation. I think you can reach a bunch of different audiences. Um, I think... Uh, sorry, there's like so much built up. Um, <laughs> it's quite all right. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think, like I said, people kind of pigeonhole indies in, into one or the other, and I really don't think you should necessarily do one. I mean, it's fine if you do, but like, I don't think you have to. I don't think there should be a differentiation. Um, we're branching. Unlikely Hero Studios despite sounding like a superhero company is going to be doing all kinds of shit. So like we do that. an anthology that has all kinds of stories in it. Um, yeah. Um, like <laughs> well said. No, well said. Kat? Yeah, I feel, especially in recent years, I think the lines are kind of blurring of what indie and indie is, uh, the different spellings. But uh, yeah, because we have things like Webtoons, we have things like Kickstarter. I just did the panel about Kickstarter where we're getting to see all these different genres. And yeah, things like Image that does release, okay, here's a romance book here and a horror book there. And then I I mean, I do think of indie, the, the IE as the underground, sure, but... Um, I only see underground as, you know, postmodern in a lot of ways. It's like questioning art, but I think mainstream, cause we've kind of gotten to a point where mainstream comics are doing the same thing. Yeah. We're seeing them question art. So is, is really the IE, the punk rock of comics? I don't know if they are anymore because I think comics in general are in this landscape of questioning art. I think where we're every, a lot of mediums are like that. So I think the lines have blurred maybe because of the different voices luckily that we've gotten in comics but the different ways people are getting comics a lot of times really the only way people are getting comics was the comic book store it's the only mm -hmm. way they thought they could get comics but now that we have the boom studios on um kickstarter we have more people reading webtoons comics m m triple the amount of people reading webtoons comics than people reading batman i think we're really seeing that comics mean something different in the past five years also with superhero movies and, and Walking Dead and seeing that these indie books that maybe sold, a, you know, 100,000 copies are now biggest TV shows out there or The Boys and stuff like that. So I just think that the definition of indie has changed um, in the past couple of years. I absolutely agree with that. And I think what's really interesting is one of the basis for this uh, concept was about early ideas about marketing and audience building. So here in Columbus, um, we have a very strong comic community, but it is uniquely geared towards the alternative underground side of things. They are the more famous mm -hmm. side versus the mainstream side. So mm -hmm. us as, as more mainstream creators, we were always kind of on the outside of the actual market that we were a part of, which is always kind of an interesting thing. Um, it didn't stop us from creating under any circumstance, but having that awareness, we knew that maybe if we wanted to excel in this game, we needed to look beyond our own, you know, local market to really build upon. And I think we, we've we been able to do that. Um, the next one, number three is the most controversial. Um, it's my favorite one to talk about. It is know your budget. And obviously for the writer side, um, we are usually the commissioners of projects. And when we are working with artists, um, the faux pas that I tell every writer never ever to do is to ask an artist what their rate is. What I always say is build a budget that you can afford because asking a person what their rate is has no actual bearing on what is in your pocket. So you can, you can glean information. You can ask people to kind of get an understanding of what fees are out there. But if you don't know and recognize what literally you have access to, it doesn't matter what anybody else says their rate is. It's better for you to lead rather than, you know, step back, hope, ask and request. Um, so when it comes to that, um, I think that there's a question of the collaborative nature in the indie market. And I want to hear your experiences with how you managed to collaborate, to find people to collaborate, particularly when finances are involved. Mike, you're last. I'm starting with you. Yeah, you're last. You're absolutely last. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. Kat, how would you how would you answer that? Oh man, that's a really interesting question. Uh so I have a background. I just gotta 
MFA like a year ago for uh, producing and writing TV. So Congrats. we did a short film and uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, we did a short film and I was a producer for that. And I think I learned a lot about just budgeting and how to make a budget, literally making a budget. And I think a lot of, especially a lot of indie creators, they're just like, yeah, you know, I'll just, uh, let's make this $2,000. I think it's about $2,000. You have to know like how much money is going into your printing. How many books do you want to print? How many you know, backers you think you're going to get, um, you know, how much are you paying your artists? How much do you want to pay for variant covers? So I think before you even um, say, I'm going to launch this Kickstarter page, make your budget because that's really, really important. And also just like any budget, you have to have some flexibility. So if you think it's $4,000, make it $5,000 because it's probably not going to be $4,000. And uh, talking about other creators or, you know, collaborating with other creators slash artists, um, I do believe, you know, you know, artists should be paid the amount that they they just think they deserve to be paid. So I'm a little flexible on like, do you ask for the rate or not? I usually tend to do so and like, what's your rate? This is my this is my budget. Would you be willing to go this low? If you're not, thank you so much for, you know, taking your time and thinking about it. Um so yeah, I, I usually try to play devil's advocate slash fifty fifty on that. Like I, I try to be upfront about my budget, but at the same time, not lower their rates because, you know, I understand, you know, I understand the freelance life. So I don't want to, you know, um, say, oh, it's $200 and they end up, you know, their their usual price is a thousand, whatever. So I think you you also have to be upfront on what your budget is and understand what they think they deserve for, which they do deserve for their pieces. So, uh, yeah, I would just say understanding the economics of comics, maybe even before you start writing comics or before you really jump into that Kickstarter, just understand what, what a budget means. It's it's definitely one of the most important things on, on creating. And then you can even possibly make money off your Kickstarter. Uh, luckily, I did so. I made a lot more than I expected from the Kickstarter because of my budget, thank you. Um, and that's important, but that's because I've had experience in doing other Kickstarters and, you know, knowing how much things cost. So, um, yeah, I think it's just trying to, to learn everything you can. Uh, being a creator and being a writer is more than just being a writer. You're a PR person. You are a producer. You're everything. And you have to have multiple hats. I agree with that. Lori? Um, yeah, I agree a lot with Kat. Um, Especially uh, now, like where we are at now, um, I try to look at kind of who I want to hire and what I want to do. And I see if it's an amount that I think I can kickstart and an amount that I think I can, you know, pay the artists for like an amount to kickstart, let's say six to eight pages for a, a, what we call a pitch package or whatever. Um, and kind of go from there. Uh, I think. As an inker, I find it really important to pay artists. I don't, we haven't done much collaboration. Um, even if we, you know, we make a deal like Kat was talking about um, where maybe they'll take a lower rate before the Kickstarter and then I'll pay them after the Kickstarter. You know, we've done stuff like that or, um, you know, you pay them a percentage of sales or whatever it is. Um, like, I think it's really important to get everyone paid, get the writer paid, get the letter paid, get everyone paid. Um, Cause I'm always not also the, I'm also not always the writer. Sometimes we hire a writer like John Pence. He writes The Surgeon and we want to get him paid too. Believe it or not, we pay writers too. <laughs> I think it's important to bake that into the Kickstarter cost, you know, everything. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> well said, well said. Ted? Uh, and I also uh, I had like a film background. I um, We made a feature film and this was that, passion project we did it back in 2004 is when we shot it and everybody was working for sort of back-end pay and you know we were just busting our ass on this feature film um which never really got distribution that got anybody paid back and it, it was you know we made sure it was a positive experience for everybody going forward but um i realized when i started going into the comic field I think you, you kind of, as a creative person, maybe you get one of these projects where you, you get people to kind of buy in and, and do it for favors and everybody's, but I didn't want to do that again. I didn't want to become that guy that's always going to that well. So um, I felt like I could do the coloring. I could do the lettering, you know, M Milo, the co-writer of the uh, Milo Miller and I would write it. So all we really had to do was hire an artist and we did take the approach of just putting an ad out. I think at that time we put it on, um, uh, da, 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 da. well, digital webbing is what I would recommend now. And, um, 
we found Benito Gallego and we, we, we got a hundred, 200 artists from all over the world. So we were asking them, yeah, what is your rate? You know, so we can find out if we got somebody's art that we really like and can we afford them? And because the process, again, that sort of glacier speed thing, um, you know, I can afford this many pages a week, you know, and I can, I can get a, an artist that, and, you know, and as we're getting the pages, we're starting to color them. So the whole thing's coming together. And, uh, you know, I think the thing about glacier speed though, is sometimes you, you are kind of like that turtle that somehow wins the race, you know, because if you just stick with it and you keep moving, you know, three years, four years down the road, you've got some, you've got a catalog, you know, and the people who meet you on the convention floor, they don't realize that this took all that time. They just see all the great stuff you got. And, and, you know, so I think it's good to just always move forward, even if it is slow. Um, did I get off track of what you were asking? No, no, no. no. I like that. I like that. We'll, we'll stop you right there. Right. Chuck? Uh, hey, Kat, you and I have something in common. You have your MFA, and I'm, M- and I'm an MFR. So, I mean. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, but, no, man, you know what? Guys. You're creative. You're a creator. So sometimes think outside your wallet, man. Like for me on on this new one, you know, our budget was only so much, but we wanted to level up. And how are you going to level up when your wallet's empty, you know? So for us, there was things like I traded my editing skills for, you know, for colors, for covers, for all sorts of stuff. You know, I, um, I did some promotion for people and helped them out. Like all that kind of stuff helps. You're a smart person, man. What What do you have that you can use to benefit them so you guys can both work out, man? Because, again, if you're only thinking with your wallet, you've already put – a uh, a line as to what you can do and i'm like uh uh-uh, i'm up there how am i gonna get up there because i'm way above where my wallet is and so uh you guys gotta you, you gotta think ahead you gotta do that kind of stuff and also you gotta be willing to make some moves that maybe don't always make sense to everyone else but it you know it does to you i had uh, this cover artist i saw him i loved his work and i told my partner i said dude we need him and he's like, well, I don't necessarily love his stuff. I'm like, it doesn't matter, man. What he does is perfect for our book, and he sells. And I went to the match for that guy. And we're five days into our Kickstarter, and his package alone has already paid his bill. He's already paid off. Yeah. And that's because you you got to think creatively, and you got to know, man, hey, dude, I'm telling you, this will help us. So, you know, just, just think ahead, man, and always think higher than you are because that's the way you're going to level up. I like that. I like that. Thank you. Danny? Oh, you're going to take it to me? Um, he said I'm last. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mike is last. <laughs> he said I'm last. <laughs> Mike is last. <laughs> no, I think that, you know, Kat, you brought on, you touched on a lot of great points. And I think um, the whole Kickstarter experience is a whole other thing. That, and for us, we learned a lot from, uh, I think we learned more from our second Kickstarter um, with Short Fuse than we did our first one. Um, and really understanding the cost behind getting those rewards out and making that part of your budget. Um, you've got to know what it's going to cost to print the books and, you know, then also understand what it means if you're going to start throwing stuff in that, those Kickstarter rewards that are not media, unless you want to try to push it at the post office. You know, there's a lot of little, little challenges you may run into, um, that you want to work into your budget. Um, fortunately we haven't had a bad experience as far as Kickstarter, but we definitely, you know, it was eye opening to say, wow, that's actually, it costs that much to deliver those rewards. Um, I've, I've, been a part of um, backed a lot of Kickstarters. I mentioned on one earlier that I backed a Kickstarter from the UK. It took a while to get the book done, and they, when it came time for them to ship the book, they did not have enough funds to actually mail that book internationally. And they hit me up asking for an extra like fifteen or twenty dollars to ship the book, and or they could not ship me the physical book, which I think shipping was more than the actual tier that I backed, which is a whole mm-hmm. other subject about. You know, set your tiers properly. Don't give the book away for six bucks in your Kickstarter because you're not going to make anything. Um, but yeah, I think you know you've got to know your budget. And you know, to Mike's credit, he, he's fantastic about going out, finding talent, meeting artists, having a discussion with them, and then being able to walk away with an agreement of what's going to work for them and 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 uh, something they're happy with it as far as a wage. And then one of the other things I've noticed is that we tend to you know pointing at Veronica over here finding talent that we enjoy working with that um, there's absolutely nothing wrong with finding a freelance artist or creative paying them for, for them to produce whatever they agree to produce. And that's the end of that. But I truly love working with people that have a passion for what we're working on. And it just, 
it's so much more rewarding to get to the, to that finish line with that product and know that they're a part of that. And I think that plays into sometimes the, what I, I, I've charged $45 a page and this is my flat rate. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, I think we are ready now. What you got? Dollars, cents. They cost something. That is unintelligible. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> what was that? I felt like I needed to come with some deep. I don't know. Look, okay. man, um, money is is can be a problem or it can be a great thing to get you through. Um, I remember a day where uh, a young a young Mike Watson and a Victor Dandridge came into a comic mm-hmm. convention with a hundred free burritos and tossed them at everybody and sold books. Yeah. Um, yeah. I and I'm gonna I'm gonna reference back to Lloyd because I think she's getting the full blunt of this. I am a very enthusiastic person when it comes to making these damn comic books. The most enthusiastic the most. person. <laughs> and um, I like I like to lead with my passion. And um, it has taken a while to understand understand that and work with that. But like, I rather work with somebody that is on the same level as let's make this book. What do we have to do to make this book happen? And and you know, and I think they come out stronger than that. And I completely agree that. People should be paid what they're worth. If you set up agreement for people to be paid or whatnot, those things should happen. And I will be the first advocate to say, I am not fucking perfect. I have tried things and they have failed to smack me in the face. I have tried things and they have been ultra successful. There are things that I wish I would have done completely different, but I did not. And I have to live with those choices and power through and fix those things and move forward. And that's what I've tried to do my best. That's what I'm trying to do um, with myself. But then working with these projects, um, like I, we, we got something cooking in the kitchen right now. And our thing is we wanted to find people that really wanted to work on the project to make it happen. Like, um, but I, I love what Chuck said. You got to get creative with this. And like, as soon mm-hmm. as Chuck said that, it made me think about all the stuff that Victor has done with his context and things like that. It's like, uh, <laughs> I'm going to put you on the spot right now for a second, Victor. Okay. Victor is the hardest working man in comics and he's worked himself quite a damn good reputation. A reputation in the indie comic scene and the convention scene, and he got to a certain point to where he could offer, a, he can offer to get you into a show if you did a couple pages for him. And it's like, do I really want to try to charge this dude sixty dollars a page for ten pages, or do I want that seven hundred dollar table at this show and try to sell my stuff and make about twelve hundred dollars in a weekend because I'm in the opportunity to go there with the table, a hotel. <laughs> fee and all that stuff. So which one, which one's more important right now at this moment? So, um, and you know, and I've tried to model myself after, uh, um, after a few things like that and trying to get creative and stuff. Um, but I realized this circuit, the circle of people that I'm with right now, I don't, that's the, those are the people I want to work with. And when I'm looking for people to bring into FSK or work on a title, I'm looking for those same type of people because I understand, um, Make it, I don't, I, I, don't, I can't tell you the last time I made, like, I made money on a book for myself that I could just go out and spend on a video game or something because I put it all back into the books. I put it all back into the, the promotions, you know, you know, getting stuff for it, you know, just uh, so being creative, hustling, using your resources. Um, like Chuck said, I've used my skills to trade for stuff back and forth to get things. So, um, yeah, you, you, you got to have a little financial. You got to have a little creativity. It, it's about it's your, it's your recipe. What recipe are you going to use? There Everyone you go. Is different. There you go. All I like that. that. All right, I like that. No, you no, got no. That. You got so that. That's a real point. And, and my, my recommendation to artists that are coming in is to not um, consider yourself on the basis of deserve. Look at what it is that you actually can can guarantee a return on because any funds that is paid to you in the production process is an investment. And you want to look at that and say, I know I can get you back this money plus some. And if you can't do that yet, that's when you really need to kind of take a step back in terms of your declaration of your page rates, your values, Um, particularly because as you're in the indie market, our resources don't quite work that way. And if you transition to the mainstream market, they tell you what you're going to make. You don't get to go to them off rip and be like, this is what I want. They say, oh, you, this is your first book for Marvel? $100 a page. Yeah, but I did $100 a page. That's what you get. So it, it gears you for that. Yeah, go ahead. Real quick. That, uh, I had somebody. Uh, now, I'm very upfront with people. 
I, I'm not gonna be a always be upfront, baby. I'm I'm gonna be all the way up front with you about stuff. And um somebody was upset because we took one path where uh we were paying through a Kickstarter, but our the stuff got delayed or whatnot. So I didn't have the funds to pay that person and they were all up my they were all up my butt about it. And I was like, as soon as the funds clear, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you money. <laughs> like uh, this this is the arrangement that we made, right? This is the arrangement that we made. And I not to toot my own horn, but I, I do uh, freelance for Marvel and Upper Deck through the, to the card division. Do you know when I get paid for those cards? When? Six months. Six six months to nine months from after the cards are approved. Wow. Wow. <sighs> so so waiting, waiting is part of the game, baby. Yeah. And like, I'm not saying, like, I'm just saying, like, this is what the so-called professionals do. And, like, I'm not arguing it because I get to throw that on my resume. That's an experience that I have. That's that's stuff I get to put in my portfolio. That that alone has gotten me access to certain combo conventions because I can say that. So the wait is more than worth it. So when I like when I've sat here and I come to the green with you, and now because there's a little bit of wait, we're complaining about the green. I'm like, dude, I've got to wait six to nine months for my <laughs> for my cards from Marvel, and I know they got money. They got money. Disney money, yo. Right. Disney money. Okay. <laughs> House of Mouse money. All right. So number four. Number four is all about merchandising and the idea of when to start merchandising. When do you start branding for your projects? And I want to know, uh, Chuck, we'll start with you and we'll work our way back around through Ted and everybody. When do you start merchandising, uh, branding, promoting your projects? You know, I would honestly say I'm not quite there yet. And okay. so – for me personally, a lot of it, it was, you know, I think a lot of us guys were so excited about merchandising right away. So my first Kickstarter, I had shirts and I had all this other stuff and they didn't do that great. I mean, who's going to buy a shirt of a property they've never heard of before? And so that was really difficult. So on this most recent Kickstarter, we were like, look, let's focus on the stuff that's really going to work. And then you work your way out. I personally find, feel like early on, if you want to do the merch and you want to bring that up, that's what stretch goals are for. That's where you can start aiming for that stuff and playing with that stuff. So with this uh, Kickstarter, because um, we're still trying to build up that brand and because my partner and I are, again, not uh, financially where we want to be, we're, we're taking it slow. And so instead, we focused on the things that we knew could um, really add to the brand, add to the book, and make it better. So it was a lot of variant covers and stuff like that, really make people want to buy the book and hold the book. And then as we're getting – and we're, we're already almost funded, so once that happens, we can start thinking, hey, what do people want? Do they want coasters? Do they want pens? Do they want – you know, whatever. So I think – don't get ahead of yourself on that because you're going to want to make the kick-ass shirt first time around and nobody ain't wearing it, man. Like it's, that's not, that's not happening right away. So feel your way into that one. I like that. I like that. Uh, a cat. I 100% agree. I, I rather spend my money on a really great variant cover because no, if you, especially if you are a Wednesday warrior, you go into the comic book shop. I mean, there's definitely different types of people that buy comics, either just for the story. A lot of them are there for like the spec books, for the variant covers, for like, oh, I'll pay $50 for um, a grifter variant cover, whatever, or like whoever the artist is. So I rather, as I guess maybe a Wednesday warrior, I rather spend the money on making a variant cover. And I, I definitely know I can make revenue and make a profit off of a variant cover more than a t-shirt you look at okay like jonathan hickman's x-men's doing really well those hats that have the little x symbol they're probably selling like two of them at the comic book store but look how many books they're selling of that variant cover that mm -hmm. jim lee did so i think knowing your audience if your audience is like very much into merchandise or if like you're i was gonna say if you're into action figures or whatever if you're selling like something like spawn like, you know, okay, then go focus on those action figures because people want that. But no, if your audience is mostly just there for the comics, then I say focus on the comics. I don't even know. I don't know what level you could be at for merchandise. I, I don't know. That's actually like a big question. Like, when do you start for that? It, I would say if, if you're a bigger publisher, honestly, if you're a boom or an image or maybe when another company, you know, an action figure company comes to you and says, hey, I want to merchandise your stuff. I think that might be more worth it than you focusing on merchandising. Uh, I say focus on the comics. Well said. Well said. Lori? Uh, yeah, I also agree. Um, when we started, uh, we made the mistake of getting really excited about merchandise. 
Uh, we produced a shitload of super shirts and blitz toys. <clears throat> okay. And toys, as some of you probably know, um, the only way to produce them is to produce, I think, a minimum of a thousand. Mm hmm. And we still have Blitz toys, like, in boxes everywhere. Like, they, I'm just being straight up with you guys, like, they don't sell. Like, they're great to give away. People got, the people who are super big fans of Super, like, got really excited about them, and they love them, and they have one, and that's great. But, like, it's not an investment that you should, like, until, like Kat was saying, like, until you're, like, an image and you have, like, a million people, like, it's really rough to produce merch. Um, so since we discovered that, like, we still make merch on our Kickstarters, we have pins, we have, uh, buttons, we have, uh, prints, art prints, uh, you know, more expensive, like, metal prints, stuff like that, um, but we produce them in really small quantities for the people who want them, and we might have, you know, something like 20 left over for our store, but, like, that's a more, that's what I've found to be, like, a more realistic amount for what we're doing and like going crazy and you know same thing with shirts like if you do shirts it's better to go through something like Redbubble that produce them like print on demand than you yeah. know buying 300 shirts and then trying to sell them because you'll never move them because there's not enough you know like one percent of your it. fan base is going to buy right. shirts right or use t public who uh freestyle comics is using get some of those uh custom shirts uh yeah. on sale today only yes. say, say it mike <laughs> right, I'll give you a link right now. You there know. we go. Thank you. Thank you. Know. you. That was a perfect. <laughs> Lori did the perfect alley. I was like, let me just perfect. go ahead and dunk that in there. Let me just get that. <laughs> Ted, what about you, bro? Um, yeah, I've had a, a different take on that. Um, actually, uh, variant covers for me are the thing I struggle with. You know, I, I don't really, as a reader, see the value in them, and I'll do them. We do we do two covers for all our books, but again, we're we're doing story covers, so it, it takes a lot longer than just doing a, a, a pinup of a character. Not to say that that's what anybody here is doing, but um, I find that the shirts really move for us, and especially at the conventions. Um, so I'll take and and we have an extra little hook with all of our shirts. You know, I I wanted our shirts to be the most comfortable shirt in your drawer. So I, when somebody comes to the booth and they're like, oh, that's kind of cool. I, yeah, now feel that fabric, you know, and then they're like, oh, why? This is really nice. You know, um, Michael, you've got one, right? I do have one, I'm, and I'm wearing it on our Chat and Draw episode on Monday. But is that not the most comfortable shirt you own? Danny, would Danny is a connoisseur of shirts. And when I slide him this shirt, he's going to be super jealous. It is. It really is. All right. So, but like our Palma shirt has this Cleveland skyline behind it too. So even if you don't know who the character is, you just got this cool character in front of the Cleveland skyline. So that, and so many of the shows we do are regional. But then uh, Tap Dance Killer, uh, people just like the look of that character. Mm -hmm. And there are people who don't even know the book that just want the shirt. They come by the booth and they're like, that's cool, you know. So, and same thing. Then, then when they feel that fabric, that then I got them, you know. If they if they're interested at all, as soon as they now feel that fabric. So, um, and with the uh, with punchline, uh, our Kickstarter now we've got a t-shirt level, and it's doing pretty well because people know that that is good, and we even call that out like this is going to be the softest shirt in your drawer. So, I like, um, I like it's that. we've had to go and and I'll order like um. I don't like a hundred at a time. We've got a nice uh, local uh, distributor here or printer. And so, um, yeah, I, and, and prints I've fought, you know, those are things that will we'll also sell, but they don't move like the shirts do. Gotcha. I think we're getting close to time. So uh, Danny, Mike, I'm gonna have y'all jump in there and answer that one. Uh, when you so start like, to merch. It depends on the merch, man. I'm kind of in the middle. Um, uh, and I'm, I'm gonna uh, quote Chuck again. You, you got to be creative. Uh, I, I went to college with a guy who made that for me. Gives me a real good deal, and that, that bad boy's printed out in 3D. Right? So I can charge $25 for this hat, but I can order like three or four from him and go to a comic book convention. Also, knowing your audience, like Lori's talking about, how many people do you think are really going to buy this? Like, I know, although I would love it. I would love it if 500 people are going to Team Public to buy these shirts. But I know it's it's a certain amount of people that are going to buy these shirts that ask for these shirts, which is why I use T Public and Red Bubble so they can print them on demand. I really don't make any money on the shirts. I just want them to be able to have the product, and I don't have to worry about it because it's up there. 
I, I will say my recommendation recommendation of going with T Public over yeah. Redbubble is the price the the quality of their shirts and the price point is too high knowing that the artist is probably only getting two to four dollars a cut per mm. shirt. T Public's a lot lower. Brand new shirts today, and it's not not to plug the shirts, but when an artist puts new shirts out, they're thirteen bucks. Yeah, that's not cutting into the artist's take of that new shirt. But I think you know, that goes into the the, the on demand aspect of it. You know, again, we don't have conventions right now, so we can't go out to those conventions and sell buttons yeah. or, or prints or, or t shirts right now. You can use on demand. I mean, it, it, I love the fact that I can buy a shirt, or I, we sold a hat earlier today to somebody, and I don't have to package that and ship that once I get it. They're going to send it directly to mm -hmm. the customer for us. Um, so I think if you're smart about it, you can do um, merchandising. Obviously, it depends on what your skill set is. If, you, if you're if you graphically inc inclined or you have to pay somebody to produce a print that you're going to turn into a shirt, those all have to go into, into uh, a factor in, in those decisions. But I think we have so many cheap resources now online that makes merchandising okay. And it's yeah. my point. I'm not going to sell enough of these shirts to, to at this point to, to make a profit off of it, but we have a fan base that wants that stuff. Andy, shout out to Andy who bought six shirts or five shirts and a hoodie today. Mm -hmm. um, Andrew bought uh, a hat and wanted a couple prints. So we have the fan base that we know is going to buy this stuff, but right now we don't have any, any stock on hand, so we don't have to worry about it sitting there. Um, and we don't have to worry about shipping either. They're going to take care of that for us. You, you need to have the options available. to Absolutely. Some um, one thing that I always learned um, since being in college is that uh, you have to treat your product like it is an IP because it is no matter what level you're at. It needs to you need to treat it like an IP. And so if I go into a meeting or I go talk to somebody or I'm, I'm showcasing a portfolio, guess what? I'm going to Redbubble and I'm stealing those model pictures. I'm taking them right off their website and it's going to my presentation of it. I'm putting together my trailers. My, like everything I do is presenting my con the comics with freestyle comics like they are being presented by Marvel, DC and image on the same level with those things. And one last thing about shirts. I'm in the middle of them. Ted has great shirts. They're, they're great designs. Um, I got two of them. <laughs> so I, 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 I think and you got to have a great, a great design shirt. It can't just be a character plopped in the middle of it. And I'll, I've learned that from Sean Mack, because if you look at the old shirt designs, from like three or four years ago, it's just characters in the middle of the shirt because I'm like, oh, my characters versus look at the shirts that we have on T-Republic right now where I'm actually trying to design the shirt. And uh, I forgot who said it earlier, but uh, it was Andy. We straight ripped off that Marvel, <laughs> that Marvel Comics old school 90s logo. And I, I call it the Marvelous FSK shirt uh, because I want to try to generate some familiarity with people like, oh, that looks like a Marvel shirt. That looks cool. Let me get that. Uh, Mike, uh, both Redbubble and Marvel just called and issued a cease and desist <laughs> right right now on this panel. I just want you to know that. Okay. Um, what's what's amazing is so my recommendation to this point is to tell people to merch merch as soon as possible. However, do it as smart as possible. Recognize that your first billboard is you. So before you get anybody else the access to a T-shirt, hat, anything, you should be wearing it so that you are already branding. I this mean, project, even you know, before. Pretty example of that, Vic. Uh, though the guy may or may not be popular, depending on your beliefs. Right. Vince Skyver stopped Mike at a convention. And was sure like, did. What is that on your shirt? And it was the actually the cover of Hot Shot Number Nine, but as a T-shirt. Yep. He said to me that he was like, "Come here, like, what I is that?" that was, he said, "I thought that was a DC character that just." Yep. Went. I was like, "Man, that's so great to hear, man. That's I, I, I'm glad you said that." And he was that's like, right. "Oh, I'm drawn." I was like, "What?" What do you do? Because I didn't. I honestly, I had not put the name with the. Mike is terrible at recognizing people. I am. And then um, he told me who he was. He's like, yeah, man, I did. You know, I worked on Green Lantern. And I designed the logo for the Yellow Lantern and stuff. I'm like, and you like my shirt? <laughs> <laughs> and Tommy did, did that convert to a sale? He did. He came on my books. Well, there you go. He came there on it is. Books, and then, Listen. <laughs> and and even more to that point, even something as simple as this hat right here that says Freestyle Comics on it, I kid you not, I was wearing this one day, I was at Chipotle, and the dude scooping my food stops and looks up and he goes, so what is Freestyle Comics? Boom, now we have a conversation. So remember, you are always your first billboard, that's where you start merching is yourself. 
you know, when you're going to shows, don't wear nobody else's product. You don't got to wear a Marvel T-shirt to prove that you belong at a convention. If you're behind the table, you paid the price. You deserve to be there. If there's somebody's character that should be represented, it should be yours. That's 100 percent. All day, every day. The fifth principle, and we can kind of run through this one with a head nod, is to set reasonable goals for yourself. Everyone wants to win. Everyone wants to be at the top. But the truth is, the first thing that you have to do is finish one page, finish one book, get one sale, get a return sale. Those are the things. Do that one at a time on repeat, and you will find success. Do you guys agree with that? Yes. There we go. There we go. No one just comes in and breaks a million dollars unless you're Keanu Reeves. But then he's still he's Keanu Reeves though, so he had to start somewhere. Okay, he, he made somewhere. a brand. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So definitely recognize those are the five uh, important principles, the VIPs of self publishing. I want to thank you guys for joining me and giving all your insights to everyone that's listening in. Thank you so very much. Rim McKenzie is 100 percent right though. Y'all need to be getting some stickers. Yeah, get some stickers. Good look. To the poor man's merch. Exactly. <laughs> or buttons. Or buttons. Shout out yeah. to Mutant Cactus. Free Mutant Cactus. I want to shout out everybody. Thank you for being on this panel. You guys are amazing. Uh, big fans of everybody. And I, to some degree, I've worked with all of you and Chuck. Yeah, we're, we're about to start kicking it, buddy. Um, yeah, we are. So thank you so much for being on this panel, guys. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. I think I got maybe, I don't know if we're going to see you guys again. I got to check my list. But we got to get off to the next one. And thanks for hosting this one, Vic. See you guys. Bye. Thanks again. Bye. Thank you. All right. All right. We got the next panel coming in. See you, Ted. Bye. (laughs) All right. We got the next panel coming in. It is. Do I have to? Oh, yeah. You can just bang out. You can just close it. All right. Later. Later. Uh, We got the careers of geekdom coming up. All right. All right. All right. And we got a couple minutes before we jump into that one. Um, uh, I'm looking forward to this panel so much. I'm big excited. All right, but I also want you guys to go get some comic books. So let me tell you about a little company I'm with. I happen to be the publisher of it, Short Fuse Media Group. Check out our books. <laughs> Chill. 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 I think it's time for me to save the day. Grace. Grace. Y'all know what it is. Know what it is. A hot shot. Let me heat it up Burn. My girl think that I'm creeping Cause sometimes I leave her stuck go, yeah. I'm thinking in my mind I'm just trying to save the world you know But she is. always think I'm lying And be trying to lay with girls yeah, yeah, Take yeah. a walk in your shoes I would rather fly I fight for justice and vigilance You would rather die yeah. Now I'm trying to shed a little light To the darkness He trying to bring me down Like a woman with Hey! And we're back! So make sure you check out that website And if you're just now tuning in We are in full swing we're in the third shift, the final shift of FSK Day today. And FSK Day is a day where we are looking for donations to help us further make our comic books. And we're not greedy at all. We are asking for $1. That's it. You can hit us up at PayPal, Cash App, or Vimo right there at the ticker at the bottom. If you want to send in more than $1, please do. I'm not going to tell you no. But I will appreciate it. My team will appreciate it. Yes, we will. And we will make these comic books for you. Now, let's say, Mike... I want to do more than donate. I want to buy some books. That's great. Then you're going to go to this website right here. Short Fuse Media Group. Check out our books. If you buy the physical copies, you get the uh, digital copies for free. So be sure to do that. And you're like, Mike, I want to check out some comics or some T-shirts. I can get, hey, I'm here for you. We got T-shirts on sale today, normally $20. They're 13 bucks today. I'm rocking them. Veronica's rocking one. Danny's rocking one. We sold a bunch of them today. Go get your FSK t-shirt. We got them for you on sale. You're like, Mike, I don't want no stinking shirt. I don't want no comic book. I want some art. I got that art for you too, baby. We got an original print available today. All right. 10 bucks. Shipping is $3. Hot shot in the building. I call this hot shot saw a spider because he doesn't like spiders. I don't like spiders. And Veronica came down here this weekend and was like, I'll do some colors for you real quick, real fast. I'll just color that real quick for you. All right. So $10 for each one of these prints. Shipping is $3. And we just did chat and draw live a few panels ago. And I was uh, challenged to draw a venomized hot shot. All right. Now, I thought that was a clever idea. I was super excited by that. 
and I drew it, and then Veronica just sat here and colored it. So this print is also available today, $10. Look at all these exclusives I'm giving you. We love it here. Exclusive, exclusive, exclusive. I'm going to load this up, all right? And I'm going to pull it up, and I'm going to unveil it to you, but we need to get this panel started. A panel I'm very, very excited about that I can't wait to talk about. It's the Careers of Geekdom. I'm going to show you this pic. Oh, there it is. Oh, my God, it's so good. It's so good. You know what? We're going to do this real quick fast. All right, let's get it rolling. Make your donations now because we're trying to hit that $500 mark. We're almost there. 